We were pulling into a parking area that looked as though it had recently been constructed just for my car. What about the legal battle, Har? Has anything happened there lately? The plethora of claims and counterclaims continues within the courts. There have been some rumors that the Quads were negotiating a settlement sans their attorneys, but those have been officially denied by all parties. Which means, of course, that they're probably true. Probably. A settlement would certainly be big news. The end of an era. I wonder if that's why we're here. To witness the settlement? I don't think so, boss. You're a private eye, not a notary public. <laughs> Thank Gates for that. I understand they do get far fewer attempts on their lives. Where's the fun in that? We parked and were ushered into the main mansion by the polite, bodiless voice of the computer. As usual, for the duration of our visit, Harv would mostly communicate with me either by whispering silently in my head, or when stealth and silence weren't priorities, through the traditional interface that I wear on my wrist. Very few people in the world know that Harv is hardwired directly into my head. The secret has helped me out on a number of occasions, so I like to keep it as quiet as possible. Plus, if truth be told... It's not something I brag about, or even like to think about too much. Thank you again for coming so quickly, Mr. Johnson. Miss Thompson is awaiting you in the great dining room number 7B. If you'll permit me, I shall vocally escort you to your destination. That'll be fine, thank you. The computer led us through Ona's mansion, and I was grateful to have the guidance, because I'd never have found my way without it. We've arrived. I've alerted Miss Thompson, so please feel free to enter. Thanks. I appreciate your help. It was my pleasure serving you, sir. Well, it's about time you showed up. The space was a formal dining room, sumptuously elegant and, not surprisingly, enormous. All four quads were there, and none of them appeared to be what one would call happy. Ona stood by the table, arms crossed. Tua, the superhero, was beside her, hovering about a half a meter off the ground. She was in full costume, a tight red crop top, white miniskirt, red boots with four-inch heels, and a long blue cape. Thria, the fairy queen, was in the background just a little, away from the table, as though she'd been pacing before I entered. Her long green robe danced around her gently, as though moved by a breeze which I couldn't feel. Two tiny nymphs flittered around her head, sparkling with pixie-like glitter. She was crying, and she had those heroically strong, tear-stained cheeks that you read about so often in fantasy fiction. But it was Fora who embodied the trouble. She was wearing a thick black faux leather jacket and gloves, a short skirt, and black tights. Had the room been any darker, I wouldn't have been able to see her at all, she was so shadowy. She was the only one of the quads who didn't look angry or overwrought. As a matter of fact, she looked rather content. But that didn't help matters much, because she was also lying dead on the floor. As you can see, I have a problem. 